Part 4. The New Abolitionists. Chapter 8. Particular Heroes of Recent Memory. While in prison, I received much correspondence thanks to the publishing of my address by Judy Brown's American Life League, Advocates for Life Ministries, Life Advocate, and several small, local activist publications. One activist, Tom Sexton, wrote me a letter dated April 4th, 1986, about a fellow named Joe Langley, whom he had visited in prison a few times. Quote, he is at Bridgewater State Mental Hospital in Massachusetts. That place is another world. He said there's some mood-altering drug called Thorazine that they give him. The prisoners watch TV all day. They get a couple hours every day to walk around in the courtyard, but they can't walk on the grass. Joe says the rosary while the other guys watch all-star wrestling. Joe Langley has some emotional instability, but at least he knows it's wrong to crush helpless human babies. Joe took a snow shovel handle, broke into Planned Parenthood mill, and totaled out their suction machines before they opened one day. Then he waited for the police to come. They put him in the local nut house. He voluntarily committed himself and let him go that night. The next day he went back with a baseball bat. He didn't threaten anybody, but he wanted to go into the mill. They seized him and sent him to Bridgewater for observation. That's a long story. Keep in touch, Tom. Parenthetical, we just don't know whether to put old Joe in the hero list or not. Maybe he just suffered from some monomaniacal fetish about the preborn. Possibly he just had nothing better to do. Ah, but Joe did right, and we shall let God judge each according to the gifts and talents he has distributed. So here's to Joe. We lift up our cup. May it go well with him. How shall I name all the fine examples of extraordinary service? I could not, and still do justice to those whose names may never be known. Are there not many who have wreaked havoc upon the child slaughter houses who remain, quote-unquote, at large? Maybe, on the other hand, there really are too few to be named. Only one has indisputably laid down his life for the children. That one is Michael Griffin, sentenced to, quote-unquote, life in prison for shooting the Florida abortionist David Gunn. But there are indeed many whose actions are to be respected. We list a few, but first a word about those who have decried the use of force in its various forms and degrees. The Detractors Sadly, many of the leading lights, from whom we normally anticipate godly wisdom, have shown forth great double-mindedness. When it comes to this issue of force, with its logic pressing hard upon advocates for the preborn, there is much fuzzy-headed thinking, and it is not for lack of intelligence or intellect. John Lofton, the pugnacious defender of Christendom and former columnist for the Washington Times, wrote in that paper, April 3, 1985, an article entitled, Real Christians and the Holocaust. Zealous to defend the name of Christ against those who would slander it by impugning Christians for failing to resist the Holocaust, Lofton said that those who called themselves Christians but failed to fight the Holocaust, quote, were not real Christians. He goes on to praise those men like Reverend Dr. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who plotted the assassination of Hitler, adducing this fact as evidence of true Christian character. But when it comes down to proving out such quote-unquote true Christians, by today's test, the screen goes fuzzy. A few years later, Mr. Lofton was confronted not with the volatile issue of lawful, lethal force against evil men. Rather, he was faced with the elementary question of whether the deed of peaceful abortuary blockaders was right. And his incredible answer, quote, no, no, no. The otherwise notorious critic of pietistic and, quote, antinomian Christianity suddenly metamorphoses from a reformed to a, quote, New Testament Christian. He flees to the bosom of his equally double-minded mentor, R.J. Rushduni, quoting him to the effect that since there is no, quote, civil disobedience against abortion in the New Testament, it cannot be practiced by Christians today. Of course, the New Testament does not record any assassination attempts on the part of Christians either. While on the subject of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we mention the inconsistent pronouncements of the Christian Action Council. The organization led at the time 
by Kurt Jung circulated a flyer with a picture of Dietrich Bonhoeffer with a quotation from his ethics declaring abortion to be murder to announce a pastor's protest for the fall of 1985. Yet this same leader, who apparently approved the ethics of assassination in another generation, decried those who destroyed the death camps of his own time. Cal Thomas, commenting upon the bounty of abortion bombings current at that time, said in 1985, The line I liked best came from Janie Bray, who put her tongue in cheek and said, I am personally opposed to the destruction of property, but I respect the right of people who do it where babies are being slaughtered. That was when President Reagan was in the White House. It is noteworthy that the President himself did not condemn the bombings until a year after they had begun, and at that, only immediately after the major Christian, pro-life, politically oriented spokesman of that time finally condemned them. That was Jerry Falwell. Interesting it is, both the power of public opinion and the influence Christian leadership can have upon the political process if it flexes its muscles. But were the bombings right or wrong? Comes now a different climate, a pro-abortion regime. Is this what has influenced Kyle Thomas to say concerning the termination of a serial child killer, quote, tragic and wrong, for Dr. Gunn to be murdered, question mark. In the present climate, would Mr. Thomas pronounce the same judgment on bombings as he did in 1985? If not, what has changed? Following the shooting of abortionist Gunn in Florida, Operation Rescue Leader Virginia, David Crane's comments in defense of the action were splashed across Norfolk's Virginian pilot, March 12th. The front page headlines read, quote, some abortion foes laud slaying. The elders of Dave's church called him in to confer about his proclamation. Their summary objection concerning the ethics of slaying one whom they acknowledged to be a professional murderer was that the level of force might have been excessive. They questioned whether or not lethal force was necessary to stop the murderer. We are not aware whether or not the church has made a formal statement in support of maiming abortionists. However, we believe that in God's providence they were given precisely what they said was lawful and good in the Shelley Shannon case. The abortionist was shot in both arms and able to return to quote-unquote work, allegedly within a day. We are curious to hear those elders pronounce further on the question of force. Was the level of force too small? What would be just right? On a similar note, Pat Buchanan's criticisms of the bombings of 1984 were technical and strategical and therefore distracting to the main point. The abolitionist John Brown did not seek to evade responsibility for his raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. If the anti-abortion bombers believe what they are doing is moral and necessary, why are they not standing outside the clinics when the police arrive? Now, we haven't heard Pat Buchanan pronounce on this aspect of Michael Griffin's action vis-a-vis -vis walking straight up to the police who were unaware of the shooting and declaring both his deed and the need for an ambulance to look after the abortionist. But if taking the life of the abortionist complicates the intervention issue, what about the action of Joe Langley, who waited for police to arrive after he destroyed the machinery of abortion? Can he approve of it? We haven't heard. Chuck Colson pulled no punches in response to the Griffin event. In his Prison Fellowship newsletter, Jubilee, May-June 1993, he wrote, Dr. Gunn's murder was a horrid, senseless act, immediately condemned by responsible pro-life leaders, and it left not only a bereaved family, but also a nation struggling to maintain its democratic balance. Colson elected not to talk about all the bereavement that will not be suffered by the mothers who did not kill their babies that day. But there are more important factors to be noted in Colson's evaluation. Number one, the abortionist is called a doctor. Number two, all leaders who do not condemn the termination of the murderer are judged irresponsible. The saving of babies takes a lower priority to Colson's reactionary concern 
that such acts endanger democracy. He continues to turn the tables by calling on the, quote, many on the religious right to avoid paranoia in responding to the anti-Christian bigotry gathering against fundamentalists, anyone who takes a belief in God seriously. The paranoia of Christians in conflict with the growing bigotry, quote, threatens the lifeblood of the democratic process. Colson wants Christians to calm down and dialogue. After all, we are in a pluralistic society. Does that mean we must communicate with the Aztecs, witches, and Satanists with whom we share citizenship? There is good reason to look doubtfully upon Colson's counsel when he urges that we quench the truth for the sake of dialogue over the subject of baby killing. Furthermore, what obligation do we have to preserve the quote-unquote democratic process when the Christian republic in which the process was to operate has been destroyed? What is the value of such a process when it serves to advance a worse system than what we have had? Did not the democratic process, absent the law of God, put Hitler into office? But for the sake of this dialogue, we must be more peaceful, Colson complains. Our language is sometimes dangerously strident when we use inflammatory terms like baby killer. Do we not bear some responsibility when an unbalanced person takes our words as license to become a doctor killer? Once again, truth is abandoned to sway the readers. Why is the abortionist called a doctor? And why is the slayer of the murderer called unbalanced? Why ought not a person who kills babies be called a baby killer? And why does Colson use deceptive terminology when he tries to persuade Christians to avoid or condemn forceful means of rescuing children? What are Colson's priorities? Is he willing to suppress the truth for the sake of dialogue and the salvation of democracy? It would be futile to speculate on the causes for each individual's lapse into illogic when faced with the burden of responding to the crimes of his own time. It may be fear for one man, loss of job or constituents or supporters or friends, or power or influence. It may be ambition for another, career advancement, or political aspirations or reputation. It is something, however. Perhaps one of the most notorious examples of a man who sells the truth for a mess of political pottage is the race-baiting, office-seeking, power-hungry Jesse Jackson. Here is a man who has suppressed and denied the truth in order to gain a position of power. Here is a man who in 1977 argued against Roe's thesis that a woman's privacy rights justify abortion, saying that this premise, quote, was the premise of slavery, you could not protest the treatment of slaves because that was private. But political office was on the horizon for Jesse. If he would only adopt the agenda of the left, the means to advancement for him. No Democrat could go anywhere within the party without embracing the left. Carter, Mondale, Dukakis, Clinton. The pressure to conform is enormous. Like children, we succumb to peer pressure, though we are exhorted to resist conformity and rather be transformed by the truth, Romans 12, verse 2 and following. We must hold to the truth and let the chips or the judgment fall as God wills. A host of heroes. Precious few voices have been raised in proclamation of the truth relative to forceful rescue of the innocent. Early voices in defense of demolition of abortuaries in the mid-80s included Rick Woodrow, Executive Director, Life Amendment Political Action Committee, columnist Joseph Sobran, Notre Dame Law Professor Charles Rice, Joseph Scheidler, Pro-Life Action League of Chicago, Patrick Monahan, Esquire, Free Speech Advocates, and Father Ed Aronson, Addyville, Illinois. There were plenty of others, obviously, who did not have occasion to make public proclamation of their views. In the wake of the shootings of abortionists in 1993, some pro-life leaders have affirmed the justice of forcefully protecting the unborn against practicing abortionists, while withholding recommendation of the tactic. 
Others have simply defended the action as justifiable homicide without qualification. Among these groups are included David Crane, Operation Rescue Virginia, Roy McMillan, Operation Rescue Mississippi, Reverend Tony Pisson, Pastor, Evangelical Mission Church in Forest Hill, New York, Joseph Foreman, and Reverend Matthew Truella, Missionaries to the Preborn. Father David Troche, parish priest in Mobile, Alabama, defrocked following his public statements in support of those who would kill an abortionist to save a child. Paul Hill, former PCA Presbyterian pastor, director of Defensive Action, organized to proclaim abortionist slaying as justifiable. Father Thomas Carlton and Andrew Burnett, founder of Advocates for Life Ministries and publisher of Life Advocate magazine in Portland, Oregon. We proceed now to commend to you some examples while acknowledging the many heroes out there who remain unmentioned here. Listing a host of such and including a biographical sketch of each would be a useful book for another to write. James Demers, British Columbia. Sometime before he married and begat four children, Jim Demers traveled to Europe and eventually to Israel where he spent a year working on a kibbutz. Soon after that stay, he began to see a parallel between the plight of the unborn and the victims of the Nazi Holocaust. It was in January of 1985, after establishing a family, that Mr. Demers walked into the local Kutenay Lake District Hospital and destroyed a Gomco uterine aspirator. He declined to pay the $2,000 restitution and served 30 days in jail. Later that month, he walked into the hospital and loaded up the same type of machine into his 1979 Ford truck. He drove home, drilled a hole in its motor, and returned the machine. Then he turned himself into the police. In October, the jury convicted him of mischief and theft. The judge suspended the sentence, gave him 18 months probation, and ordered Demers to perform 100 hours of community service. Standing before one of his judges on September 15, 1987, Demers declined to pay for, quote, the killing machine, and said, Your Honor, every sentence or punishment meted out by a court is a message and a lesson. In this case, Your Honor, the lesson you would be teaching me, and the message to other citizens, whether you intend it or not, would be that when you know something is terribly wrong, turn away. When you see a black man being lynched, walk away. When you see a Jew being gassed, don't make a ruckus. And in this case, when you know that a helpless child is in danger of being suctioned apart in your own neighborhood, turn your back. That is the message of any sentence you impose. It is not a lesson you intend, but it is there. Your Honor, I cannot, I will not turn my back on these victims. If it is only that I will not pay or assist in paying for this killing machine. Jim's good work meets, of course, the high standard of Pat Buchanan. Jim did his good deed, turned himself over to the powers that are, and made his testimony before the court. Whether it be machinery, buildings, or abortionists, we shall name such styles in which one uses force and turns himself in as, quote, the Buchanan method, unquote, of rescue. Edward Markley. The Benedictine pastor of Our Lady of the Shoals Church in Tuscumbia and coordinator of pro-life activities for the Diocese of Birmingham, Alabama, walked into a Huntsville abortuary in 1984 on two separate occasions and splattered red paint on the walls, carpet, and bathroom. Father Ed Markley said he had intended to, quote, do something in the pro-life cause for Father's Day and thought that damaging the equipment of an abortuary would be a fine way to do it. Vicki Sloop, the nurse working in the abortuary, had the job of signing the arrest warrant for Father Markley. She was a member of Good Shepherd Parish in Huntsville. The deed of Father Markley was apparently somewhat salvific for her, if not for the children who were saved by procedural delays. Mrs. Sloop was saddened by the affair and resigned her job. Bishop Joseph G. Vath of Birmingham issued a statement June 20th in support of Father Markley's right to act according to his conscience. 
Quote, if one is convinced that abortion is the taking of innocent life, according to the revealed word, he is not acting unjustly, according to God's law, in defending the innocent unborn. The bishop fell short of approving the actual deed, but affirmed that the right to life superseded property rights. The Diocesan Commission on Peace and Justice issued a statement in support of Father Markley, as did the Benedictine Father Hilary Draper, Abbot of St. Bernard Abbey in Coleman, Alabama. Policemen Best known ex-policeman among blockading Christians is probably Chet Gallagher of Las Vegas, Nevada. On January 28, 1989, Officer Gallagher drove up in his police uniform and instead of arresting blockaders, dramatically sat down with them. Michael Garrity, Chief of Police for 12 years in Redwood Falls, was jailed in Fargo in June 1991. He had joined with others in a blockade of North Dakota's only abortuary. Married for 30 years and father of five children, he risked losing a comfortable retirement which would have been his in six years. In a telephone interview from jail, he said, I've spent 22 years in law enforcement. During that time, I've dedicated my life to protecting innocent people. This is a continuation of that. Only these are small people. Sheriff Hickey of Corpus Christi, Texas, announced in January 1990 that if abortuary blockaders were to come to town, he would not send his men to arrest them. He said that to do so would be to, quote, abet a murder. Congressmen, looking for a way to justify passing the FACE, Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Bill, with his intended federal intervention, summoned the sheriff to D.C. to hear him testify. He said, I will not be party to the slaughter of an innocent human being. If requested to remove rescuers from abortuary doors, I have said I will not. The sheriff cited other examples of the type of civil disobedience he was championing. Quote, the Declaration of Independence, the Boston Tea Party, the American Revolution, non-enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act, civil rights protests of the 60s. Another good example comes from Texas. In Mesquite, abortuary director Billy Mumford complained that when she reported a bomb threat at her death chamber, the officers took her to look for the bomb herself. Mayors and Cities by 1985, at least 14 abortuaries had brought lawsuits against cities for denying them business permits. Other cities have tried to zone abortuaries out of their towns. In Fairfield, New Jersey, a city official rejected a business permit to Susan Hill, saying her abortuary would generate too much traffic. When Hill took the township to court, quote, opponents complained the clinic could trigger a herpes epidemic, according to Hill. In Bay, St. Louis, Mississippi, Mayor Larry Bennett forced the local abortuary to close for two days in January 1985 by refusing to renew its tax license. Citing the recent rash of bombings, he said the center was a threat to citizens' welfare. Bennett chose to let it reopen, however, after a brief legal battle. Judges we have already mentioned the excellent jurisprudence of Judge Burkhardt of Omaha in Chapter 5. The most famous judge who regularly dismissed charges against blockaders is retired Judge Harold Johnson of Bridgeton, Missouri. John Ryan, a man who encouraged blockades in St. Louis and inspired many by his writings and his actions, was dismissed by Judge Johnson 100 times after repeatedly being arrested for blocking abortuary doors. Now, raving pro-abortion zealots have called blockaders everything from vigilantes to terrorists, leaving themselves little remaining in their nomenclature by which to label the loathed users of force. Of course, in the current moral quagmire, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. One man's vigilante is another's guardian of justice. Washington Times columnist Fred Reed has written in defense of vigilantism. He had Barnard Geats of subway fame in mind, as well as those who might run rapists out of town to spare little girls. The question is not whether do-it-yourself law is a good thing in itself, 
The question, it seems to me, is whether do-it-yourself is better than what we currently have. Personally, I say you do anything you have to do to eliminate the danger. Protecting one's children is an imperative that takes precedent over any law ever made. If the law won't do it, and obviously it won't, you do it yourself. Society has to control the viciously violent in some manner. The idea and civilized way is to have the police and courts do it. But police can't because the courts demonstrably won't. People then understandably do it themselves. Unquestionably, had Mr. Reed illustrated his principles by applying his arguments to the plight of the pre-born, he would have been hounded out of a job. We shall make up this lack and cite examples of such vigilantes, quote-unquote, and terrorists, quote-unquote, who have raised a strong arm to protect the pre-born. The history of abortuary demolition in America by means of fire or explosives over the past two decades is not well reported. Neither the major media nor most of the anti-abortion media have reported the events extensively. Handily, however, the National Abortion Federation has been keeping account. Drawing upon statistics kept by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, those fine folks who decimated the religious community in Waco, the National Abortion Federation produced a compilation of data on demolitions from 1977 to 1990. 1977, five combustive interventions, two in Ohio, one in Burlington, Vermont, one in St. Paul, Minnesota, and one in Omaha, Nebraska. No one was captured. 1978. Five combustive or explosive interventions in Ohio. One in Vermont, one in Iowa, and one in New York. No arrests. 1979. A solitary $100,000 combustive divestment of the Bill Baird abortuary in Hempstead, New York. The rescuer was found to be not guilty, quote, by reason of insanity. In 1980, all was quiet and peaceful outside the womb. In 1981, a man entered the Minneapolis abortuary of the bomb in a briefcase and was arrested. In 1982, one in Illinois, one in Colorado, one in Oregon, two in Florida, one in New Jersey, one in Arlington, Virginia. In 1983, one in Norfolk, Virginia, one in Boston, Massachusetts, one in Montreal, Canada. In 1984, 29 in all, 5 in Florida, 2 in Georgia, 5 in Texas, 1 in Delaware, 5 in Maryland, 2 in D.C., 1 in Virginia, 3 in Washington, 4 in California, 1 in Oregon, a fine rally. 1985, 22 in all, 2 in California, 5 in Oregon, 1 in Illinois, 1 in Arkansas, 3 in Louisiana, 1 in Texas, 2 in New York, 5 in Ohio, 1 in D.C., one in New York. 1986, 13 in all. One in Missouri, one in Ohio, three in New York, one in Louisiana, four in Illinois, one in Kansas, two in Michigan. 1987, 14 in all. One in California, one in Illinois, one in Indiana, one in Alabama, five in Minnesota, one in North Dakota, four in Ohio. 1988, six in all. Three in Texas, one in Florida, one in Washington, two in California. 1989, 10 in all. One in New Jersey, one in Pennsylvania, one in Missouri, one in New Hampshire, one in Louisiana, three in Florida, one in Michigan, one in California. 1990, eight in all. One in California, one in Oregon, one in Massachusetts, three in New York, one in Indiana, one in Kansas. From 1991 to 1993, we have no report on the total demolitions. However, we do have a more general accounting, which includes vandalism, invasion, burglary, and death threats, in addition to demolition. The NAF reports a yearly decline from a high of 149 incidents in 1985 to a low of 52 in 1988. Exponential increase begins in 1991 at 95 doubles in 1992 to 186, and rises further to a projected 269 in 1993. By the grace of God, there remain many good Christian soldiers at large out there. If you suspect them in your neighborhood, don't lock your doors or hide your daughters. 
These, of course, are not thieves and rapists. They are kind to women and children, rescuing the innocent from death. And they are those whom the Almighty has seen fit to leave unshackled. They have their reward. And God has his purpose for them and shall guide them according to his will. As for those who have been captured, we print their names here. John Brockhoft, Matthew Goldsby, James Simmons, Catherine Simmons, Kay Wiggins, Don Benny Anderson, Matthew Moore, Brent Brode, Derek Giroux, Charles Cheshire, John David Newchurch, Reverend Michael Bray, Kenneth Shields, Thomas Spinks, Joseph Grace, Reverend Dorman Owens, Joanne Crapel, Cheryl Sullinger, Randy Sullinger, Chris Harmon, Robin Harmon, Eric Svelmo, Frederick Tips, Shane Cameron, Richard Dwayne Batson, Peter Birkin, Joshua David Graff, Curtis Beseda, David Holman, William Lanning, Walter Kefover, Jason Philly, David Spohr, Scott Garman, Marjorie Reed, Dennis Malvesi, Carl Chinera, Frank Wright, Jr., Donald C. Pryor, Jr., Michael Fix, Michael Griffin, and Rochelle Shelley Shannon. We proceed to expand on only a few of these God-fearing rescuers. Joseph Grace Joseph Grace burned the abortery in Norfolk to the effect of a quarter of a million dollars on 26th May, 1982. He was at the time a 34-year-old house painter. He received a 20-year sentence and remains in the sordid Burkeville, Virginia jail. Joe was expecting that the Lord was going to return soon, and just thought that he would get ready for him. He didn't want to be caught on that day when he comes for judgment, as a citizen of this bloody land, without having raised a hand in defense of the innocents. A local reporter at his trial recorded the following comments from Mr. Grace. Abortion is wrong enough to warrant the extreme action I took. I think the womb is so unique and sacred, that it should not be turned into a place of death. I felt that if the law were right in the first place, abortion would not be legal, and there wouldn't be an abortion clinic there, and I wouldn't have burned it. Dennis Malvesi Dennis Malvesi is a Marine with some skill in constructing explosive devices. He was taken from a broken home and reared by nuns in an orphanage. Returned to his mother at age 14, he lived on the streets of New York's East Side, the rough part of town for those of you unfamiliar with the geosocial situation. He joined the Marines at age 17 and did two tours to Vietnam in combat as a radio man. Mr. Malvesi spent about five years in prison, following the dynamiting of several New York abortuaries. He gave himself up to police after Cardinal O'Connor appeared on WNBC-TV's Evening News and made a plea to the bomber. Authorities knew the bomber was a devout Catholic on the basis of certain religious insignia, a medal of St. Benedict, left at the bombing sites. The submissive and devout Roman Catholic obeyed the call of his superior and explained to Judge Griesa, If he says not to do it, I cannot do it. That supersedes man's law. Whether it's right or wrong, that's his problem. The Cardinal, indeed, has a problem. He bears the responsibility for the babies who went unprotected by Malvesi and guilt for the punishment Malvesi suffered. Marjorie Reed Marjorie damaged abortuaries in Ohio and New Jersey. She is also a wife and a mother who had been a foster parent, taught migrant workers to read, and as a big sister had worked with young people. She has been in prison since October 17, 1989, under a 10-year prison term. Mrs. Reed is in the federal prison in Mariana, Florida. John Brockhoft as the Cincinnati Inquirer put it recently, Brockhoff burned Planned Parenthood's Margaret Sanger Center in Mount Auburn to the ground on December 30, 1985. 
Brockhoff has been in prison since January 11, 1991, under a seven-year sentence. He is a Vietnam veteran who was in the territorial waters of North Vietnam when the war ended in January 1973. He returned home to a land which decided to legalize killing American babies. He tells the story of his awakening to the plight of the preborn. Norman Stone was walking across America with, quote, the bodies of seven slain babies in little caskets, displaying them at gatherings of concerned citizens along the way. John saw them on Saturday, December 28, 1985, at a protest in front of an abortuary. He writes about the impact of the truth he observed. These were third trimester babies. They were all intact. There they lay, naked, in their little caskets. All of their bodies were perfectly formed, including the limbs, but their skin was terrible to look upon because of how they'd been burned alive by the terrible solution. It was a bitterly cold day with the temperature down around zero degrees Fahrenheit with 30 mile per hour winds, and I had an urge to cover up their little bodies against the terrible cold, even though I knew they were dead and could feel nothing. Still, it was terrible and gut-wrenching to see them lying there like that, naked. But I forced myself to look at them long, to motivate myself, to do what I believed I should do. My heart was full, not only of grief, but rage as well. I was ashamed of being an American, and, especially, an American man, ashamed of being part of a lukewarm church. At the sight of the abortuary, John contemplated appropriate action. As I stood there on the sidewalk that morning, taking a final look at the bodies, I knew what I would be doing after midnight on Monday morning. I recognized the extremely high statistical improbability that any of the other pro-lifers on the sidewalk were thinking all of the things I was. So if I didn't do the job, it wouldn't get done. My calculations of the unlikelihood of any other pro-lifer striking proved to be correct, because when I looked at the Planned Parenthood's abortion chamber at 2.35 a.m. on Monday morning, the building was not in flames. So, I had to be honest and ask myself, if not me, who? If not now, when? Only a few hours remained until the killers were planning on opening the doors. And then... John burned that abortuary to the ground. Mr. Brockhoff resides at the federal prison in Ashland, Kentucky. Curtis Beseda. In December 1983, Kurt Beseda set the first of four fires. Two abortuaries were destroyed. The disparity between the number of attempts and the number of successful demolitions does not reflect poorly upon Mr. Beseda's competence to accomplish a task. On the contrary, the cause of Mr. Beseda's multiple attempts was his extreme concern for the surrounding property conducting legitimate business. Thus, Mr. Beseda set the Everett Feminist Women's Health Center on fire three times. In the first two efforts, he called the fire department too soon. The first was a $40,000 job, the second only $10,000, and the third was a $70,000 job yielding a $120,000 loss to the Everett Feminist Women's Abortion Facility. The other abortuary sustained a $70,000 hit, bringing the aggregate divestment of the abortion industry at the hands of Mr. Beseda to $190,000. Joseph Sobran wrote an editorial on, quote, Mr. Beseda's Crime in the Washington Times, April 11, 1985. He began the article as follows. Last fall, activist liberal priest Father Robert Drynan made an interesting point. Quote, Eli Wiesel's whole family was wiped out because people like me were silent. I kept wondering, what are we silent about now? Sobran suggests that Father Drynan have a talk with Kurt Beseda. Interviewing Mr. Beseda over the phone after he had been in prison for six months of his 20-year sentence, he received a clarification of the difference between his rescue action and protest. Demonstrations, pickets, loud shouting, marching, quiet prayer, 
civil disobedience, all of these are publicly acceptable forms of protest. But direct action against an abortion facility is not protest. It does not seek to sway the multitudes or issue a statement. Direct action simply recognizes what is in fact taking place, that innocent human lives are being destroyed, and that the only appropriate response is the one that stops this killing. Once in the clutches of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, one's primary hope of freedom rests with the Parole Commission. That agency extends mercy occasionally to offenders, granting them parole within the bounds established by Congress. The discretion which the Commission uses is swayed in favor of the prisoner by a number of means, primary of which is expression of remorse. It did Mr. Beseda no good in terms of freedom to answer Mr. Sobrand's last question. He records as follows. I asked him whether he would do it again. Twenty years is not proper deterrence, he said. If you want to deter me, show me that it's wrong, which will be difficult, because it's not. Strident. I remember the word well. The advice of my lawyer was repeatedly to avoid being strident. One must find something to show remorse over if there is to be any hope of mercy from anyone in authority. And if one can show no remorse, he must nevertheless avoid appearing to be strident. But for someone who stands unwaveringly for the truth, stridence is hard to avoid. Truth is not for sale, not for money, not for reduced jail time. And so speak he did, and not without disciplinary action, from the prison in consequence. Mr. Beseda's home paper published on his 30th birthday an interview with him in which he said, While it behooves us to resolve our differences through discussion, the only civil response to impending murder, no matter how it is perpetrated, is to stop it. Now, it must be understood that our justice system has one standard of punishment for the repentant and another for the unrepentant. This might seem to be a good idea if two suppositions were accepted, viz. that, number one, a main purpose of punishment is reformatory, the rehabilitation of a criminal, and number two, the infallibility of laws and the judicial process. Judges and parole commissions want to see a criminal grovel in deep humiliation and remorse in their presence. And this godlikeness of the civil authorities is not without supporting Christian tradition, where civil authorities have divine sanction and the rulers are as quote unquote gods. See Psalms 82, verse 6. But when the godless rule, there are great travesties to behold. Kurt Beseda spoke the truth when USA Today requested an interview from him between his conviction and sentencing. It was not a good time to speak as he did, if one has severity of punishment in mind. But he did speak. His article appeared as a special editorial entitled, It's Not Terrorism to Stop the Slaughter. Another fire erupts at an abortion facility. Headlines and news reports are filled with accusations and denials. Threats are hurled back and forth. A simple truth registers itself on the heart of those dismayed, concerned, or apathetic. Tomorrow, no child will be put to death there. No protest can change it. No words will make it happen. No law can help the next day. Children will not die there. Rising to denounce the event, a myriad antagonists quickly respond. Leading the list are many pro-lifers who characterize themselves as quote-unquote non-violent. The word timid may more aptly apply. Do they act one iota more responsibly than their counterparts did in Germany 40-odd years ago? The fair-minded individual quickly points out the property damage and risk to others that direct action hazards. That same individual, though, balances his judgment with something that is not a what-if. If the abortion facility remains open, the death of scores of human beings is certain. This public display of stridency offended the majesty of Kurt's earthly judge. Kurt was convicted on November 9, 1984. He was sentenced six weeks later on December 20th, 
The USA Today article appeared in between conviction and sentencing on November 23rd. Another article with similar statements from Kurt appeared in the local Everett Herald the day before sentencing. Kurt's arson conviction for a quote-unquote first-time offender normally would carry the largest count, 10 years in this case, and run concurrent with all the other counts. Under federal guidelines, 10 years would have been the normal maximum sentence. The actual time spent in jail would have been six years and eight months. Had Kurt been prosecuted by the state rather than the federal government and received the usual sentence for arson, he would have been in prison no more than three or four years. But the judge saw in Kurt, apparently, a fellow who was stubbornly adhering to his beliefs. Moreover, expressing them publicly was an offense he could not tolerate, so he imposed the harsh sentence 20 years, under which Kurt continues to languish. Forget all the rumors about criminals getting out early. Not so in this case. Kurt passed his ninth anniversary in the fall of 1993. He is the senior prisoner in Latuna, near El Paso, Texas. Don Benny Anderson and Matthew Moore. In May 1982, Anderson and Moore firebombed two abortuaries in Florida, garnering an immediate abortion industry loss of $462,000. The next month, Mr. Anderson firebombed a Virginia site for another $18,000. Anderson had also kidnapped a husband and wife abortion team for a day in an attempt to persuade them to take leave of baby killing. Anderson was sentenced to 42 years and is presently in the federal prison in Fairton, New Jersey. Harry Raymond Bodine. On March 4, 1991, in Visalia, California, Mr. Bodine, 44, attended a hearing where Judge Howard Broadman ordered a woman to have an abortifacient implanted. Mr. Bodine fired a bullet that narrowly missed the head of the judge. Mr. Bodine gave explanation later for his action. He cited the just war theory. Apparently, he believed that the judge, by ordering the woman to be fitted with a device that kills newly created children, was declaring war on one of them. Not beyond the scope of reason at all, if one believes the mainstream pro-life fundraising rhetoric about a quote-unquote war on the unborn. Mr. Bodine also freely announced that he, quote, wouldn't mind shooting Judge Blackman, the judge from the United States Supreme Court, who wrote the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade, because his life is not worth 27 million babies. Until 1993, with the advent of Michael Griffin and Shelley Shannon, such action was relatively unknown. We are only aware of one other shooting event, the subject of which is unknown. On December 21st, 1991, in Springfield, Missouri, a man with a ski mask walked into the local abortuary with a 14-gauge shotgun asking for the abortionist. After a scuffle, he shot non-fatally both the owner and the manager of the death camp. We do not know whether the protector was a father, grandfather, or an uncle of one of the casualties or intended victims. But then again, it might have been someone with a portion of the spirit of Elijah setting forth prophetically God's judicial standard for those many civil authorities who have apparently forgotten it. The action of those who have employed force for the protection of the innocent has been decried by many pro-lifers as quote-unquote counterproductive to the movement. Others have declared it to be unchristlike. We answer the first criticism by noting that the burden of proof lies with the critics. What evidence can be adduced to show that the quote unquote movement has suffered? What is the goal of the movement? To gain political clout with the abortion promoting Congress? Even if that were the goal, we say that even the political pro life movement is served by the presence of forceful intervention. They can be taken more seriously as opponents of murder when some of their constituents act as if it is. The second objection is answered in chapter 3. The nature of Christ is the same as that of the Father and the Spirit. Christ is the God of the Old Testament. He is the, quote, same yesterday, today, and forever. His temporary state of humiliation here on earth 
to atone for the sins of the world, need not fool anybody. The passivity he demonstrated served the purpose of submission willingly to death for the sake of another. Although such passive human submission is a role Christians sometimes assume, it is not the only role they assume. There is a final criticism expressed in a recent statement signed by sundry notables in the blockade movement. Included among the signatories are Joseph Foreman, Bishop Austin Vaughn, Mike Schmiedicke, Father John Ostertaut, and Joan Andrews Bell. The first paragraph of the statement says, Those who take up arms against abortionists cannot simply be condemned, nor are they guilty of murder. This paragraph makes a good start. But the statement deteriorates as it moves through three more paragraphs. It exhorts pro-lifers to be like Christ, who, quote, saved others by laying down his own life. And it declares that those who block doors do this, or that at the least they demonstrate a willingness to lose their lives. To be sure, blockades have saved thousands of lives directly, and many more by the witness made, which continues to spread. But to declare that it is an act of, quote, laying down one's life is an exercise of the imagination. Only one has done this so far. Michael Griffin gave up his life, not only for the innocent pre-born, but apparently for the abortionist himself. Michael Griffin's immediate actions after shooting the abortionist were to walk immediately uh, to the police, inform the officer of his deed, and to notify the policeman to call for emergency medical help. Can anyone prove that Michael Griffin did not want the abortionist to live, though deprived of the zeal or ability to ever murder again? And how, in light of the testimony borne by the great sacrifices and sufferings recorded above, can one conclude that the wielders of force were not acting sacrificially? Are they not suffering much greater penalties than any blockaders? And have they not, especially in the example of Kurt Beseda, suffered willingly for the sake of the truth? 